Hi students, this is your professor. My name is Miriam Pacheco. Let me introduce myself to the class and also introduce the class to you. So with this presentation, um, I'm going to begin chapter one of our book, Becoming a Master Student by Dave Ellis. We're gonna talk about the introduction and chapter one. So the master student slash first steps. Um, let me tell you just a bit about myself. Like I said, my name is Miriam Pacheco and I am a professor um, at San Diego Mesa College, but also a counselor. So if you have any questions, you can always come see me in an appointment or in a drop-in basis in a counseling session at my office in, um, at Mesa College on the third floor of the Student Services Building. Um, if you are on campus, you can stop by. If you're not, um, the best way to reach me is through email contact. Okay, so let's begin. We have 12 chapters that we're going to be talking about together during this class, which is Accelerated 8 Weeks, Personal Growth 120. So let's begin. In every chapter, I want to introduce the title. I also want to introduce a quote. I apologize for the Java update. I want to introduce a quote and begin each chapter with a quote, sort of um, a way to get us started on how we're going to feel in this chapter. So I like this quote a lot since we're going to be talking about the first steps in this chapter. That's the title of this chapter. Um, I want to begin with this quote, a little step, maybe the beginning of a great journey. So success starts with telling the truth about what is working or what isn't in our lives right now. We have different personal and professional things that might be working or not working for us. And success starts with recognizing our pitfalls and actually taking action to improve. In this class, um, yes, it will go by very quickly at times and there will be a lot of reading and assignments and writing. But the reality is that you will learn in this class what you will learn in this class will actually spread into other classes. So there are tools and there are activities that you're going to bring over to another class, say chemistry or biology. And even in your personal life, this class is a journey and together for the next eight weeks is going to be a journey that I hope you get as much as you want from the class. So what you will be learning in this chapter is learning styles, discovering how you learn the learning style inventory, using your learning style to promote your success. We're going to be talking about multiple intelligences, the learning by seeing, by hearing, and moving, the VAC system. Something that I would love for you guys to do is to read the chapter before you come in and listen to the PowerPoint presentation. It just makes life a little easier for you, but for some students, it works to hear the PowerPoint first and then read, but I do want you to be reading along with the book along with me every week. It would be the best thing you could do. So let's talk about the first step. Truth is a key to mastery. So the first step is simple. Tell the truth about who you are and what you want. The first step is the most valuable of all tools in this book and it is the key. It is the key to becoming a master student. To succeed in school, which is the focus of this class, um, you need to tell the truth about what type of student you are and what kind of student you want to become. You need to acknowledge the areas in which you need to grow and improve and give yourself credit for the areas in which you already excel. Something to point out is that um, conventional traditional schooling does not fit all learning styles. Um, the fact that for some people lecture based, just being talked at is not their best learning style. And at this moment, possibly taking an online class where you just hear my voice, but not see me all the time, might not fit your learning style at its best either, because it's a very self-guided approach when you're taking an online class. Um, possibly face-to-face -face instruction is more your style, and there are times when I'm going to be uploading videos of myself talking to you and sharing ideas and how we're doing in class, but it won't be consistently. So recognizing your strengths and weaknesses are obviously the first step. And so when people joined Weight Watchers, let's say that, right? Or when people join Alcoholics Anonymous, you start by telling the truth about our drinking or you start by telling the truth about your weight gain. Um, this is a universal principle. It's when we begin to change our behavior. 
when you come and you tell a counselor, uh, like myself, I have students come in and you tell me the truth about your grades and how you want to improve, the first step is just being honest and admitting that there is something that needs to be changed. Every challenge starts with the first step. We talk about troubled relationships. Let's talk about addictions to different things. Let's talk about addictions to work. So I'm going to be referring to the term master student because that's the title of our book. But master students get the most value from a first step by turning their perceived weakness into goals, saying, I don't exercise enough turns and say, I want to briefly exercise for 30 minutes at least three times a week and starting with baby steps something you can do with this class because it's accelerated um, i would suggest that you try to read as much as you can and set a time to read beforehand so you don't fall left behind that's the little improvements you can make a master student avoids the phrase i can't or it's various um ways of saying the word i can't and use language that reinforces something that they can do. So I can, I will, I do. And those are words I want you to begin to use in my class and in other classes. So the first step is specific. So be specific in what you plan to achieve. And you might say something like, I want to take legible notes. That'll help me predict what questions on the final exam will be. Remember, you're going to have journal entries. Um, for some of the chapters, discussion board for every chapter. So I suggest you start getting specific about things that you want to improve and want to work on with this class. And any questions, remember there's a section on the discussion board where it says that you can just ask questions and I'll give you an answer. You can also email me. So again, with the slide, the first step, truth is a key to mastery. Why success starts with telling the truth how you can use a tool let's say let's for this chapter skim this chapter for three techniques that you like to try this week the what is the different things we're going to learn about in this chapter and what if i could start to create new outcomes after reading this chapter i'd like you to view this video by yourself the discovery wheel um, i'm not allowed or i'm not able to actually play it and post it and have you view it along with me because it does have sound so make sure that you go through the discovery wheel and this is something i definitely want you guys to do it's relating to your first journal entry of this class and something i want you to think about is um, these questions after you read the chapter and after you view this video and after you go through the activity so i want you all to go to page 36 of your book and do the exercise the discovery wheel exercise so that's in pages 36 37 38 and 39 and what i want you to do after doing this exercise is reflect on it because that's going to be your journal entry but i want you to think about these questions what did you discover about yourself after going through the exercise what do you want to keep doing and what do you want to do differently so these are the questions I was referring to, which are actually the answers and the questions I want you to do for your first journal entry. Um, the discovery wheel is a great exercise um, to tell us the truth about what kind of student you are and what kind of student you want to become. It's not a test. There are no true questions and the answers will have only meaning to yourself. Um, This exercise I like because it gives us a picture of how you see yourself as a student. And again, talking about where your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, I want you to total up your points. I want you to see where your total scores are for attitude, time, memory, reading, notes, tests, thinking, communicating, diversity, money, health, and purpose. Which, if you're reading ahead or you're skimming our book, these are all the titles of our chapters that we're going to be talking about in a way mirroring these topics. And so that's something I want you to go through because there's gonna be another discovery wheel at the end of this um, book. So it's something I want you to refer, refer back to. There are some areas where you're gonna be very high and some are gonna be maybe a little bit low and it's not, to men, it's not meant to be judgmental. It's not permanent. As you go through this class, you're going to be learning some techniques. So I'm wishing that some of these scores will go higher. Um, as for myself, I want to tell you that out of this discovery wheel, um, 
as a student when I took this exercise, the areas where I exceeded, excelled the most were note taking, test taking, thinking, and reading and memory and time. So very strong on the first half of the wheel. Not so much money. That's something I've learned um, with age and I've learned with um, just going through life. So that's something definitely that I've um, been constantly working at and also communicating. So as you go through life, as you go through college life, there are some of these areas where you're going to be best just naturally and some areas where you're going to learn to be better at. So ideas are tools. Students often report that this is the most important concept in this course, the discovery wheel. The choice of words we use is important, and that's what this process is about. We need to reframe how we think of ideas, and the power process is going to ask you to consider thinking of ideas as tools and not as things that you have to do. So be open to these different tools. And by simply considering the strategies in this course as tools, you'll be more open to try them outside of this class. As you read the text and listen in class, think of the ideas you experience as tools. If they work for you, use them. If they don't work, put them on the shelf. Maybe they'll be of some use later. Um, let's talk about the different tools or method or habit or approach. Um, you might use some of these already, note-taking, memorization skills, how to write an essay, preparing a presentation, getting to actual quality sleep at night, how to lose weight, exercising, finding a job, choosing a pet, asking someone on a date, traveling to class, planning a class schedule. These are all tools or methods or habits or approaches that you use, whether or not you're actively thinking about them, but you might find after this class that there are some other tools and approaches that you weren't aware of and that's something that as a master student you will learn In this next video i want you to just have a moment to look through and hear it it's about how college students um, transition from high school to college it's a short movie clip College is an experience all to itself, and it is much more than just learning academics. When you're coming to college, it's not just about mastering your subjects. It's also about learning how to live on your own, possibly, juggle work life and living on your own independently, possibly for the first time, making friends, transitioning into adulthood, making different choices about love and relationships and money. So transitioning from high school to college is definitely not something that's easy for most of us, but it is something that's incredibly rewarding after we've learned to master certain things. From right now, I want to talk about um, a chapter that when I'm teaching Psychology 101, which is something that I also do, I refer to because in this chapter, there is a part of it where it talks about sensation and perception before we begin to talk about learning styles so I wanted to share a slide that I actually use in my psychology 101 class when I'm working with students so what is sensation sensation is a process of how you detect information from the outside world and you convert it from the raw sensory data that you're getting from the outside world into your brain so when you're using your five senses you're using your ears, your uh, eyes, your nose, your tongue, your skin and, and internal body tissues and you're using your senses to capture information from the outside right now. Right now you're using your ears a lot to listen to me. And those waves are things that your senses capture and that's the process of sensation. Perception is when we select that information that we got from the outside world we organize it and we interpret it into something that's meaningful or we learn to interpret it. That's the process of perception. The reason why we're talking about this is for the next um, slide. So sensation involves detection, conversion, and transmission of raw data from the outside world into our sensory receptors. To then make sense of these sensations, we organize it, we interpret it in a process called perception. 
So if you notice, let's talk about what's on the slide right now. We're looking at a square object on one part of the slide. Which area is the top, the bottom, or the back of this cube? What do you guys think? Look at that cube. What is the top, the bottom, or the back? Yeah, depending on how you're looking at it and how much you stare at it, you're viewing different parts that are the top, the bottom, and the back. Also, the image, is this a young woman looking over her right shoulder or is it an older woman looking downward? I'll give you a few seconds to look at that, but this image has both a young woman and also an older woman. Maybe come back to see that for those of you who haven't seen both images. When you're viewing these images, your visual sensory system receives an assortment of light waves. That's a process of sensation. Right now we're using our eyes. Interpreting the lines as a cube or as an old young woman, that's the process of perception. And this is important because this is how we learn. It's part of the process of learning. So it's sort of similar to, say, when you're getting a new cell phone, you're in the process of that, or you just got one, um, and you get a phone that has way more features than your, the phone that you've had before, and you have some options for learning how to use it. Okay, so perceiving how we take in the information, processing how we think about that information. So let's go back to the idea of a new phone. Some people would use one of these five different um, techniques in order to learn how to use it. First technique, you just get the phone in your hands, you push on buttons and you see what happens. Second option, you recall how you used your old phone and follow those steps to see if it works on this new phone. Third step, or third option, you remember how you see other people using that phone and you try to copy it. Fourth option, you read the instructions manual and view some self-help videos and go from there. Or fifth option, you ask the friend who has the same phone to help you. Okay, so similar process, perceiving and processing. Let's talk about learning styles. So. In this image, and I want you to refer to page 41 of your chapter, that's when we're going to start talking about the learning styles. So you're going to see an F on the top for feeling, a W for watching, a T for thinking at the bottom, a D for doing. So these actions illustrate the different approaches that we have to learning. So the five things that I mentioned here of how you would play with this one and try to make it work are the same approaches you would take to learning. So if you're the type of person who would take the approach of getting your hands on the phone right away and seeing whether you can make it work, that's an example of learning through feeling or concrete experience. That's the F on top. If you're the type of person who would try to recall what you have done in the past with your prior phone um, to see if that works, that's an example of learning through watching or reflective observation. That's the W. If you're the type of person who would read the manual and watch those videos to help you use a phone, that's an example of learning through t thinking or abstract concepts. If you're the type of person who would take the approach of asking a friend to coach you through a hands-on activity, that's an example of learning through doing or active experimentation. That's the D. So in summary, your learning style is unique, is your unique way of how you blend your feeling, how you blend your thinking, how you blend your watching and doing. And you tend to use this approach when learning anything from the use of your new phone to learning calculus to doing chemistry. You, be, you might be more in the watching and you might be more in the thinking than you are in the feeling and the doing. It depends. Every single person has a different approach. I want you guys to ask yourself three questions using the words that are not your preferred learning style. And the reason why I bring that up, I want you guys to do the exercise in your book about what's your preferred learning style. And that'll be found on page, after page 42, it's an extra area where you actually are going to write. It's LSI1. I want you guys to see what is your top preferred learning style and ask yourself questions using the words that are not your preferred learning style. We'll continue with that. 
So I wanted to highlight um, page LSI 8, exactly extracted from your book. Um, and reason why I want to do that is... So, because this chart identifies some of the natural talents people have, as well as challenges for people who have strong preference for any one mode of learning. You're going to see, let's say, for feeling strengths, or where you can do too much of this, or too little of this, and how you can develop it. So, mastering all, all four modes requires time, practice, and commitment. You don't naturally do all four super well. Let's say you wanted to become more reflective. Then you keep a personal journal and write about connections amongst your courses. If you wanted to gain more concrete experience, you interview an expert in the subject you're learning. You conduct role plays. You form a study group to discuss the topics. Or you visit your professor during office hours and ask questions. Let's say you want to develop more of your abstract thinking. You take notes in your reading in an outline form. You supplement assigned tasks with other books. You take notes and make them into visuals, maybe charts, tables, and graphs. And to become more reactive, you conduct an experiment or do field observations. You go to settings where information is being tested. You try a new behavior described in class and then you try it out in the real world. Keep in mind that there is no strict match between certain learning styles and certain careers. Learning is essential to succeed in all careers. I don't want you guys thinking that because your mode of learning is one in particular, and that's the career you need to go to. That's a different conversation we're going to have later, not for right now. Let's talk about multiple intelligence. I really like talking about this um, because it's very valuable to know that for some people, in the field, in sciences, um, we don't equate being smart with just having a high IQ and that having a high IQ ultimately leads to success because how do you measure success? That can be different to every person. Not everybody thinks success is monetary. So there's a psychologist by the name of Howard Gardner at Harvard University that talked about multiple intelligences, that there is no single measure of intelligence that can tell us how smart we are Instead, he defines um, intelligence as flexible, and we have the ability to solve problems or to create products that are, that are valued within one or more cultural settings. And we don't just use one intelligence, we can use several. If you look at the bullets in front of you, there is bodily kinesthetic intelligence, visual spatial, mathematical logical, verbal linguistic, musical rhythmic, interpersonal, interpersonal, and naturalist. Let's talk about these. And this is an example straight from actually a psychology book. Um, your book for this one didn't actually give me like a list of things that I wanted you to be aware of when we talked about different intelligences. So this is extracting um, a slide from an actual introduction to psychology book. So according to Gardner's theory of multiple intelligences, people have different profiles of intelligence because they are stronger in some areas than others. They also use their intelligences differently to learn their material, perform tasks, and solve problems. Um, have you heard from others that you're really naturally good at something like writing or like math or spatial skills? Well, Gardner's research shows that most people possess one or more natural intelligences important to success in various occupations. So which ones do you have? Maybe start thinking about that. They might guide you to your career or not necessarily, but they might. Gardner believes that there are numerous forms of intelligence and that the value of these intelligences may change according to culture. Gardner also proposed a possible ninth intelligence, if you're going to look for me at the bottom of this chart, it's called the spiritual existential um, intelligence, which is not part of actual in our book, but that is a ninth um, area that he spoke about. And let me just give you an example. So people who use the verbal linguistic, the first one in the chart, are good at language skills and learn best by speaking, writing, reading, and listening. They enjoy telling stories and doing crossword puzzles. Okay, so if you look at this chart, it says linguistic type of intelligence, language, such as speaking, reading a book, writing a story. Possible careers could be a novelist, a journalist, and a teacher. That does not mean that a person who has, let's say, more of a bodily kinesthetic 
who prefers body movements such as dancing, soccer, and football, and would be a good athlete, dancer, and ski instructor, could not be a good novelist, journalist, or teacher. It just means that naturally, innately, you're more of a linguistic person and you need to develop your bodily kinesthetic or vice versa. Each of us has all these intelligences to some degree, and each of us can learn to enhance them. So let's talk about the VAC system. And I know that we are talking about a lot, but that's why I want you to refer back to your book and actually read your chapter. So the VAC system it refers to visual auditory kinesthetic. So we learn by seeing, hearing, and moving. That's what this um, slide is telling us. This is another way to understand different learning styles. Three ways of perceiving through your senses, seeing or visual hearing, hearing or auditory learning, and movement or kinesthetic learning. The theory is that each of us prefers to learn through one of these senses, and we can enrich our learning with activities that draw on the other channels. Example, think about how you would answer the first question, and for further knowledge, answer every question on page 51, okay? Think about how you would answer this question. You enjoy college courses that most, the most, sorry, you enjoy college courses the most when you get to what? Number one, view slides, overhead displays, videos, readings with charts, tables, and illustrations. Or you enjoy college courses the most when you get to ask questions, engage in small group discussions, and listen to guest speakers. Or you enjoy college courses the most when you get to take field trips, participate in lab sessions, or apply the course content while working as a volunteer intern. If you go through page 51 and you get more of the number one answers, these are examples of visual learning. If you prefer more of the number two answers, you're more of an auditory learning. And if you prefer the number three more, this is an example of kinesthetic learning. These are your VAC preferences. If you had a consistent pattern to your answers, that indicates that you prefer learning through one sense channel more than the others. And if you know this, you can make adjustments when the course you're taking offers a different learning style than what you prefer. I don't know if that makes sense to you, but right now, you are learning a lot through the visual and the auditory. I'm, an online class does not provide you a lot of ways where you can learn by kinesthetic learning, but if you know that you learn best through that, it would be something that I want you maybe to explore the outside world. Anything I refer to, I want you to put it in practice. I want you to actually physically take notes with your hand and apply movement to what you're doing maybe volunteer at a place where we talk about these things or go ask questions to some of your friends or parents or colleagues in terms of what we're speaking about but actively involve yourself with it because this class does take a lot of the visual auditory learning style so this is the VAC system um, I'm gonna let you guys read this slide in order to enhance visual learning I want you guys to pause here because I'm going to go through it and just skip, but I want you guys to learn through this chart and see how you can enhance visual learning, okay? How to enhance auditory learning, same thing. I want you to read through these bullets, and I also want you guys to read through the chapter. And the same thing to enhance kinesthetic learning. I want you to pause as you're going through these, and I want you to actually then go through the chapter and know what I'm saying and how to enhance both of these three styles. And the last slide we're going to be talking about today are the six paths to more powerful thinking. So there's a psychologist by the name of Benjamin Bloom, and he describes six other different kinds of thinking. Remember, the VAC system was how, about learning. Um, Howard Gardner's multiple intelligences were about intelligence. This is about how we think. So let's say that for these eight weeks of personal growth class you're going to take an idea you learned maybe at the beginning hopefully and then apply it for these eight weeks let's say that you discover that in the back system your preference is for kinesthetic for the learning through movement therefore taking this class is more of a visual and auditory like we just said so let's say that you're going to put it into action you're going to remember something so you recall the idea okay this is the back system you want to understand it, so you explain the idea in your own words and you give your own personal examples. Okay, so step one, you will remember the VAC system. That's remembering. Step two, then you explain how your kinesthetic preference might affect 
the learning of this course. That's the understanding. The applying, you apply a technique that you learned. You supplement the lectures with field trips to the movies or the museums or field observations or lab sessions or you go with a tutor but you get involved with something that involves movement that's applying the idea to produce a result. Analyzing as as you go midway through the class, let's say three weeks from now, you reflect on how much you're learning and what grades you have. Okay, that's the analyzing. Evaluating, same time, midway through the class, you reflect on the grades you have. So your analyzing could be more about the, not so much the grades, but so much of the process you're doing. Analyze if it's working or not and how that's reflecting on your grades, which is the evaluating. So maybe you're not doing something like you want to do or you're doing so much more of one tool than another. And the last step is creating. So possibly at the end of the class, you create your own new way to learn to adapt to the visual auditory kinesthetic learning in a way that works for you. Um, professors don't always have all the answers. We guide you as best as we can. We, we, we don't have all the answers, but we can definitely revisit questions you have in the discussion board or email me. Okay, guys, so this puts an end to chapter one. I want you guys again to go through your chapter, and I want you to go through this PowerPoint again if something wasn't clear, and just post your questions on the discussion board or email me. See you next chapter.